in order to set the stage for the, uh, the subsequent speakers, I thought I would focus on the data. Uh, because, in fact, in my view, that's what's truly new here and is, in fact, what drew me into this field. Uh, as I go through it, I will also, like Nigel, have an unashamedly urban perspective on it. Uh, one simple excuse for that is that's where most of the people are in the world anyway, in urban areas. And so uh, I want to talk about the data. And I, I think the first thing to understand is that there's a historical perspective here. The data have been collected for millennia. They are the origin of the word statistics. The Romans needed to manage the cities in their empire. And so you can find the roots of statistics in of the state, information about the cities. Um, but up until now, we've had, I think, a sparseness in the data, limited quality, limited coverage, that have made it very difficult to usefully measure urban systems to test hypotheses in the way that we're used to in other fields of science. But it is these new technologies that are diffusing through society that are completely changing the study of cities, the study of society. We have digital records, sensors, computing power, analytical techniques, all advancing and being promulgated at a rate that is qualitatively changing what we can understand about cities. They bring with them unprecedented granularity, coverage, timeliness, and variety. And I'm going to go through some of that and then talk about some of the issues that we have in trying to exploit these data. Uh, also, without embarrassment, my perspective is that of a physicist uh, perhaps best captured by Lord Kelvin 140 years ago or so. When you can measure something and express it in numbers, then you know what you're talking about. If you can't do that, uh, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So this is about measurement. Uh, it is about models. It's about quantitative understanding of the system or systems that make up cities. When I first got into this now almost three years ago, I asked myself the question, as a scientist, what does it mean to instrument a city? How do I go about and measure things? And there are, in fact, three buckets to think of data about cities in. One is the infrastructure, the built uh, structure of the city, its condition, where are the potholes in the road, how is the insulation doing in a particular building, and the operation of the infrastructure. Is the grid balanced? Is traffic flowing smoothly? Then there's the environment, meteorology obviously, but pollution, noise, flora, fauna. But most interesting and most problematic are the people. You can't study cities without studying people. The cities are built for people, they're run by people. If you took off all constraints about privacy, and I will come back to privacy in a while, you'd like to know location, economic communication activities, nutrition, health, opinions, and so on. The belief in what we're doing in New York, and I expect many of you have, is that if you can properly acquire, integrate, and analyze data in these various dimensions, you can make the government better, better operations, better policy, better planning. You can promote the engagement of citizens with their government. You can enable the private sector to be better, to provide new services, products, and perhaps enable a revolution in the social sciences. Now I'll have more to say about that in a moment. As one thinks about this, one of the common diseases is that there are too many opportunities here. You can fill a blackboard in about five minutes with things you'd like to do with data in cities. And so it's interesting and useful to kind of parse the landscape um, at the beginning. What problems are ripe? I would argue that the infrastructure and the environmental parts of cities are better understood in principle. After all, they were built and designed by people. They pose interesting engineering challenges, but I think not so much science. But it's the human dimensions of cities that are least well understood. Cities are where the variety and diversity of human behavior are best displayed. Lots of people concentrated in space and time. We have the interaction of people with the infrastructure. All of these make it, I think, the ripest area for doing science with data and cities. On the other hand, we shouldn't forget that there are many good applied problems 
Most of them are in how you allocate resources, whether it's space, city services, and so on. I think it's also important to remember that this field very pleasingly mixes basic and applied work. We really don't understand cities. I'm, you know, despite claims to the contrary, I don't think we have a theory of the cities. And so there's plenty of room to do fundamental work. Asking the questions about why particular features are there rather than how do we do something. Why is there inequality among neighborhoods? What governs people's choices about commuting? Is it convenience, comfort, cost, time, and so on? And as you do basic science, we run into this constant discussion in New York about hypothesis-driven versus discovery-driven. Uh, there are many people who say the only way to be doing science, formulate a hypothesis, go test it against the data. Uh, there are other folks who want to just go in and mess around with the data and find correlations. I think we need both, but it's always an interesting discussion of which way one tries to tackle things first. Most um, important not to forget is that there's a lot of applied research to be doing here. These are engineering kinds of activities where you try to find solutions to specific problems, often with immediate impact. It's the how rather than the why. How do we optimally site schools? How corroded are the underground cables? What would be the effect of a congestion charge? Because you've all already answered that. I think the answer is none uh, after a few years, uh, except maybe it costs some money to some people. Uh, a lot of this work is semi-empirical, and it's often good enough without the rigor that you expect in science, but it is very important, and is, will what, it will be what will help to pay the bills for this field. Okay, what I want to do now is go through for you a little bit about uh, sources of urban data, varieties, and give you some examples of, of the kind of things we have or can imagine having. I'll start with this chart, which comes from the Wall Street Journal now about a year and a half ago, a bit more. It's U.S. focused, but I think equally applies certainly to the U.K., if not to the broader developed world. In the U.S., there's essentially one mobile phone per person right now and they talk to roughly half a million cell towers. And as Mr. Snowden famously taught everybody almost a year ago, each tower knows which phone it's talking to at a given time. In the US, as a year and a half ago, there were about 5,000 traffic cameras. Most people think there are a lot more than this, and certainly my experience. The ATMs are all taking video. There's that silver ball that's taking your picture. There are 30 million commercial surveillance cameras in the U.S., one for every 10 people. Uh, and um, I think there are more in London, right? these, at least proportionately. Uh, most of that data just goes on the floor and is only used forensically when something bad happens and you want to go back and see what happened. And then finally, there are the ANPR machines that are reading plates at some prodigious rate. So there is a lot of data being collected already in society, again, most of it not really being used at all. I, I often like to watch the 11 o'clock news at night in the States, and uh, it's very rare now that a crime is reported for which there isn't some sort of video. And the events around the Boston Marathon a little more than a year ago demonstrated just how much data is out there, if you can get it all together and put it in a form where it can be integrated. One of our favorite things in New York is taxis. There are 13,000 yellow cabs in New York City. They make about half a million trips a day. And about five years ago, wisely, the Taxi and Limousine Commission mandated that every taxi carry GPS and equipment such that we know for every ride the start and stop locations, the time, the fare, and the tip, the medallion number, the license number, and the driver, and so on. Uh, we don't yet know the breadcrumbs of the trips, but we do know the start, stop, and time. And so that's uh, 180 million trips a year, and we have about three or four years' worth of that data right now. So of order, 500 million taxi trips. And they're wonderful sensors of what goes on in the city. Not only transportation, but economic activity, behavior, uh, mobility patterns, lots of questions you can ask there. One of my favorite graphs is a very simple one in this business, 
that Claudio Silva and Juliana Ferrer put together. It's just the number of rides per day in 2011 and 2012. Uh, and you can see the weekly periodicity, low on Sunday, high on Friday. Um, you, and you can see events like Christmas over there. There was, this is Hurricane Irene that blew through in 2011. This was Superstorm Sandy in 2012 and so on. Good measures of the pulse of the city, which I will come back to in a while. Needless to say, it's possible, given the software that these folks have developed, to drill more deeply into the data and ask if I pick two areas and can look at the characteristics of trips that started at one place and ended at another at a given time. You can ask questions like, well, if there was a ride-sharing scheme in place, how much would you save? And you would have saved about 20% over the city overall. So here's another example, just some detailed analysis. One week in May of 2011, three and a half million trips. They segregated out the train stations, Penn and Grand Central in New York against the two airports, LaGuardia and JFK. The number of trips per unit time uh, with a 15 minute resolution, more trips coming out of the train stations than the airports, but with a very nice re repeatable, uh, repeatable periodicity. Number of tips per unit time uh, shows the inverse. It's richer tips coming out of the airport than the train station. Presumably the taxi drivers know this, but it's nice to see it. Uh, laid out. And of course, you can then start to ask questions like, how do the tips depend upon the weather or the day of the week or the neighborhood in which the trip ended, things of that sort. A different uh, analysis of mobility. Uh, a group at MIT a while ago got half, and Stanford collaborating together, Marta Gonzalez was the principal uh, faculty member on this, got hold of half a million CDRs in both Boston and the Bay Area. The CDRs are the records of which tower the phone is talking to at a given time, and use that to analyze traffic patterns. This was published uh, in uh, Nature um, in uh, 2012. And you can see, for example, in the Bay Area during the morning commute, that this street in um, San Jose is fed by 51 different uh, cell tower areas, and that street up in Daly City is fed by only 12. If you're a traffic manager or a road planner, this is invaluable information. The way in which you got it previously was to run a survey every few years, ask a few hundred people, where do you live, where do you work, how do you get from one place to the other. We now have this in almost, well, it could be real time, uh, for half a million people at once. Very interesting. Marta's been doing subsequent work, as you may know, in analyzing commuting patterns, people who have a bipolar or tripartite or quad commute, and so on. As I look at this, I think our aspirations need to be tempered a bit about what we can do with the data, even though it's very promising. We will not be able to approach the precision and rigor of the physical sciences. For those of you who are not physical scientists, I will remind you that the best of what we can do in physics, the tests of quantum electrodynamics, QED, they're predictive at the part per trillion level. In other words, we can predict something called the G factor for the electron to one part in 10 to the 12th. Right, that's spectacular precision. Of course, this is a very simple, isolated, reproducible system. It's one electron, a point. And we have a simple, although non-trivial, theory with, most importantly, a small parameter in it, uh, the so-called fine structure constant, which is about 1 over 137. And so you can systematically do expansions and predictions in this small parameter. Remind you that physics is not, or physical sciences are not wholly predictive of complex systems. We see statistical behavior. We can have a good discussion about whether climate is predictable or not. It is a physical system in the end. I think in the applications of data to social systems, to urban uh, the domain, we might ultimately aspire to approach the rigor of the older earth sciences or the biological sciences. We might have frameworks or theories, <coughs> rational choice is a simple framework for thinking about how people behave. We might have statistical laws, supply and demand, for example, although there are always the excuses the ceteris paribus for uncontrolled uh, variables. My own sense is that this is going to be good for trends. If somebody predicts something at the 10% level in this business, I'll believe it. 
It's good for the identification of outliers, but at the 1% level or better, I don't believe it at all. I don't think we'll be able to approach that rigor. I'd be happy if someone would speak up and thinks otherwise. With that, let me talk about some of the challenges we face in dealing with this data and trying to extract science from it. Much of the data is observed rather than designed. Again, I'm not a social scientist, but my cartoon of the way in which a lot of research gets done is that you put together an instrument, a well-designed survey, you might segregate people into several groups depending upon their conditions, ask the questions, curate the data, and that's how you do your business. This is different. A lot of the data is collected for other purposes. It's not surveys. And so in some sense it's found data. It's heterogeneous. So many different kinds, records, sensors, imagery, phone tracks. And it's variable in its quality, its coverage, and its biases, all of which you need to learn how to correct for. The second thing is that the data are in silos. They're in disparate hands. We have data in government hands, in the private sector, in academic hands, and nobody wants to give up the data. The academics hoard the data because it's how you get your publications. The private sector hoards the data because they think there's value in it, differential advantage. And the government hoards the data often because it has the potential for embarrassment or it is how um, government departments claim their turf. And so one of the things we need to do in the open data movement is a good start in that in the government is convince people to put this data together because a lot of the power is going to be in the correlations. The other point is that we cannot easily do experiments here. Um, not only because it's people, but because the systems are so large we don't have the levers to do it. On the other hand, there are natural experiments that we can exploit. Weather happens, cultural events happen, they change activity patterns in cities. We can do before and after comparisons when a policy is put into place. We can do comparisons between neighborhoods or cities at different stages of development, culture, governance, regulation, and so on. Um, here's an example of that sort of thing having been done now about 120 years ago in astronomy. You don't get to do experiments in astronomy either. You just get to watch. But nevertheless, if you watch in the right way and you do an analysis of the data in the right way, you learn a lot. For those of you who don't know, this is what's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. People started to first put it together in the late 19th century. It went on through the 1930s. Uh, and then people finally started to figure out why these particular patterns in which you plot the temperature of a star against its brightness uh, emerged and you can make up these days very complete and accurate physical stories about why there are supergiants and white dwarfs and so on. I raise it as an example of a field in which you don't get to do experiments but nevertheless you can learn a lot. Uh, and, and then the, the last uh, point, of course, is beware about spurious correlations. Uh, Feynman has got a wonderful uh, speech that he gave back in 1974, something about cargo cult science. And the message there, uh, it's well worth reading, you can find it on the web, um, is the hardest thing for a scientist to learn is not to fool yourself. And uh, it's very easy to find correlations in data and get all excited about it, uh, but you have to keep asking what's wrong with what I'm doing rather than what's right. It's very difficult to have that discipline. I've got for your amusement uh, a couple of spurious correlations that we pulled off the web. I think, let's see, do we have the website? Yeah, there's the website if you're interested. Um, this one, uh, US spending on S&T against suicides by hanging, right? The correlation coefficient, I'm sorry it's, it's blocked out, but the R, uh, is 99% for this one. Uh, per capita consumption of cheese against the number of people who die getting tangled in bed sheets. Right. Inverse correlation are honeybees with juvenile arrests for marijuana. Um, uh, I like this one. Computer science doctorates, uh, doctorates against uh, arcade revenue. 
uh, and this one may be for this audience particularly, sociology doctorates against worldwide non-commercial space launches. Uh, uh, the lesson here, of course, is like the monkeys on the typewriter. If you go through enough time series, you will find correlations no matter what. Uh, and the challenge for all of us as scientists is to understand which ones are useful and, and meaningful and which ones are just statistical noise. Um, another big one uh, we're paying a lot of attention to in New York is, is privacy. Um, we're studying people. There are lots of norms about how one should do that. The new technologies have the potential not to breach those norms, but to create situations in which no one ever thought about the norms. And so I would urge you all, as we are doing in New York, to give a high priority on how you handle it. I think the lesson for us in New York is that we clearly enunciate what the procedure is, or what the policy is, the principles. We put into place policies and procedures to embody them. We train people in how to do this, uh, and then you audit the results and make it clear that there are sanctions if you mess up on privacy. For us in New York, privacy is a license to operate. If we don't get it right, uh, we're out of business. Common problem in social sciences new to us who come from the physical sciences, the system we're studying is reactive. And so understanding, knowing that the system is being measured or knowing what the results are will change the system. And then finally, the dialogue between the data scientists and the social scientists is not an easy one. Uh, I'm sure you've all had experience in it. It would be wonderful to discuss a bit of that during the Q&A. Uh, we come from different cultures. We have different senses of what a result is, of what science is, of what a graduate student or postdoc should be doing in a research effort. And the challenge is to put all of those together in a way that is, I th will be, I think, much more productive than either set of disciplines doing it on their own. All right, what I want to do in this last section is go through some of the features or, or thoughts that we've had in New York that we're acting on about what it takes to do this kind of data science, again, with an urban flavor. There's a long list here, and I just want to go through remarks and some examples for each one of those. The first is multi-sector collaboration. In CUSP, we've got university folks, including Warwick, very active participant. We have industrial partners, some of the large data companies or data service companies, IBM, Xerox, Microsoft. We have the US National Laboratories, and most importantly, we have the city and state agencies as partners. And it's very important if you want to have impact to be working with those folks, because they know what the problems are, they own a lot of the interesting data, and they will give you opportunities to demonstrate whether you've got a solution or not to their particular problems. The second is, it is, as Nigel mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is intrinsically multidisciplinary. I like to say we go from sensors to sociologists to civil servants uh, in the people that we have at CUSP. And I have, for example, the former city manager for the city of Amsterdam sitting across the hall from a geneticist. So you need all of these tools, real world experience, if you're going to have an impact here. You also need to be able to acquire, integrate, and exploit very diverse data sets while respecting privacy. Uh, we're building in uh, New York a data warehouse, which I like to describe as a facility that will omnivorously ingest all manner of data about New York City, government data, private sector data, our own data, make the data interoperable, and then allow its analysis with multi-layered access protocols so we don't mess up on privacy. Here's one example, some city data that uh, our deputy, Constantine Contacosta, has been working with. This is city records data. New York City passed a law about four years ago that said all large buildings have to report their annual energy use. This is a histogram of energy use of office buildings in New York City, 1,150 of them. It's energy use per square foot per year. Some buildings use a lot of energy. The outliers, others very little. That due to building construction, building operation, the kind of activity that goes on in the building, or um, is it just plain old misreporting? Don't know, but the outliers can be clearly identified and followed up on. If you look at residential 
buildings in the same way. It's much less interesting, but still a good variation in the energy use uh, by a factor of three or more per square foot. You can look at the energy use as a function of building year, year in which the building has been built. And if you just focus in on the office buildings, you can see that the new buildings are consuming much more energy proportionately than the old buildings, probably a consequence of the glass curtain walls and of the thick stone walls in the older buildings. So it's a somewhat counterintuitive uh, result. And then you can do geographic analysis of what sections of the city use energy more intensely than others. I'm not going to go through this. Just to say that this is city data, and it's there and can be accessed and uh, used. We're also in cusp on Monday of next week. We're doing the kickoff for a book that will be published um, sometime this summer, written by many people, um, a mix of lawyers, ethicists, and uh, philosophers, um, and of course scientists, data scientists. Uh, about how you do privacy and confidentiality in a very operational sense in, in this business. I think also very important is the ability to create new data streams. Uh, and I just want to take you through a little bit of what we're doing in that regard at CUSP. One of my favorite pictures of Manhattan is this picture um, taken from Brooklyn of Manhattan. It's not a visible image, but it's thermal infrared. And so we're looking at the heat coming out of the buildings rather than the light. This was taken on a clear, cold night with an infrared camera. And what's remarkable about, about it is that you can see a lot. So you can read the thermostat setting in every apartment in that building from the color. You can see that that building is hot on the bottom and hot on the top, but cool in the middle. That's because it's got a data center in it. We know that from correlative data. And you can look at that cluster of buildings, which are, I guess in the, U in the UK you'd say council housing. Um, and uh, they're terribly thermally inefficient. The heat has been turned up, so they glow red. But people open up the windows to keep the flats uh, at a reasonable temperature. And if you're a scientist, you realize you can do this in many other ways with hyperspectral imaging, radar, LIDAR, and so on, basically doing from urban vantage points, the tops of a big building, what you might do from a satellite, but with the advantage that it's cheap and also the advantage that it's persistent. You can just sit there and take pictures and watch for patterns. We've actually been doing this in uh, New York now for uh, about five months. The upper left is the scene from our offices in Brooklyn, uh, for reference. The Empire State Building is, is in the left side of the frame, and the Chrysler Building is on the right side of the frame. Uh, the image at night is shown on the right. And um, you can see that the scene is largely residential in the foreground and commercial in the background. You get a sense of the geography. Um, this is the area covered by the frame. Um, and it's about, um, I can't remember how many square miles. But we estimate that there are about 100,000 people who are living in that uh, area. And what we did was to take a cheap camera, 8 megapixel, put it on the roof, and take one frame every 10 seconds for three weeks uh, between daytime and nighttime. Uh, three color images, so it's about four and a half terabytes of data. And Greg Dobler, who's a digital astronomer by training, um, constructed an image analysis pipeline that lets us watch the lights go on and off. Uh, we, of course, went to the Institutional Review Board first. Uh, that's the committee that reviews human subject experience, experiments um, and uh, asked, is it OK? And they said, yes, as long as you don't put too many pixels on any given window so that they would then know what's going on inside. And so these are the most highly resolved windows in the scene. Uh, and you can see that you can't see anything. I like to joke that they look worse than some of the galaxy images that astronomers uh, analyze. Um, each frame is registered. The camera's moving so in the wind, so you've got to deal with that. We handpicked 4,200 windows, sources. Um, there are about 20,000 in the scene. We took a sampling of 4,200. And for each frame, you look at the brightness and so on. Here's an example of the data. Uh, this is in the red color, and this is red, uh, green, blue, all three. 
uh, one night from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m., one image every 10 seconds. Just window ID, as I told you, about 4,000 windows picked. And this is just the brightness for each window as a function of time. And you see stuff happen. This window, for example, turned on and then turned off. Here's the light curve for some window. I have no idea which one it is because of our privacy rules. You just pick one at random. Uh, the window was on for a while. It looked like they went to bed and then uh, maybe woke up again. And of course, you can make up a story about each one of these if you really want to. But there are 4,000 of them. I mean, who cares, right? But the important point is you get to identify the transitions. And then you can play the following game, which is kind of interesting. Let's take a Monday night, one Monday night, and just order the windows according to when it looks like the big off happened, when it looked like they shut down for the night. And you get this characteristic pattern. Here's time, and so on. Then you can do the same thing for a Tuesday night, this, this following night, and um, pretty much the same, slight differences. But then you can take the Tuesday data and order them according to the Monday ordering, or when they went on, and you get that. So the lesson here is that the macroscopic behavior, the large-scale behavior of the lights in the scene is quite repeatable, but the individual behavior is quite random. We can, of course, go in for each individual window and start to ask questions about the circadian rhythms, uh, and can we find some pattern if you stayed up late one night, are you then likely to go to bed earlier the next night, and so on. What's interesting about this technology is it covers a lot of people. It's non-permissive. We don't have to go put sensors out. And it's persistent. And this is a different way we think of collecting uh, and understanding what's going on in, in cities. Um, a little bit more, and, and then it'll be time for me to wrap up. You need deep studies of, of sections of cities, I think, if you're going to do this right. We're building, and we announced a couple weeks ago publicly, a quantified community project together with Related, which will be a slice of about 10,000 people in a new development in Manhattan, Hudson Yards, that will uh, be fully instrumented. People, infrastructure, environment, wonderful test bed for interventions, new technologies, and so on. Students, very important. Many of you in the audience are students. I think in the end, because this is such a multidisciplinary activity, it's going to be the students who are going to invent this field. There is our current class in a picture taken last August uh, with the mayor. This is the kickoff day. Um, I'm not going to go through the details, but uh, I know Mike has interacted with them some. They're just a wonderful bunch. Uh, we are uh, just about finished with admissions for this coming year. And uh, what's interesting about it is the diversity of backgrounds that the students bring to the subject. They're all quantitative. The objective <coughs> quantitative measures are through the roof. But these other backgrounds that they have are really interesting, ranging from architecture, economics, engineering, mathematics, physics. There's even a film person in there, right? And it's just really interesting when you get this kind of background together focused on a problem, which is understanding and improving cities. And then finally, you know, this is the real world. This is not some theoretical science only. It's got applications, and you've got to get your hands dirty. And so we're working closely with the city on various projects to improve resource allocation, measuring mobility, sensing public health, energy efficiency in buildings. Decision science, we're finding, is a very interesting application for what we're doing. So I, again, one can talk endlessly about this. Um, Entrepreneurship and commercialization we're also doing. Uh, this is already generating uh, ideas for startup companies for commercialization of the technologies we're producing. Some of the students, of course, are quite eager to go start companies on the basis of either the data they're working with or the technologies they're developing or the services that they see that the city, and by extension, all cities uh, need. Um, I want to close with just two thoughts about the big science questions. This is a science conference, after all. We've been struggling to try to succinctly frame what are the science questions that you want to try to answer with data in cities. And I'll put two of them out for you. Uh, one is, can we document the pulse of the city in its various dimensions? And I show you here two graphs that stick with me. We have many others of this kind. 
which simply show some variable of the city over time in a more or less repetitive pattern, but with interesting differences. The one on the left is the taxis, which I've shown you already. The one on the right, which I've not shown you, is the lights in our scene, uh, when they go on, when they go off. Quite repeatable, but differences on the weekdays versus the weekends. And these inspire you to ask, what's normal in the city? What's the variability from normal day to normal day? What are the correlations among these? And how does the uh, data reflect perturbations that might happen, whether it's weather, a street closing, so on? How predictable are their precursors? This is basic urban physiology that we think can now be documented in a way that very difficult to do before. And then the second question is, how do the macro observables of a city come from the individual decisions that people make? The shape of a city, the, the planning, um, residential versus commercial areas, and so on. Can we find, ultimately, uh, a good basis for the scaling that the Santa Fe folks have observed uh, for the physical structure of cities, et cetera, et cetera? So it's kind of this physiological high-frequency behavior uh, and this long-term macroscopic structure of the city that we think are the basic science questions that need to be answered. And with that, I'm happy to take questions or comments. And thanks for your attention.